that this is an argument that has two um, premises with one conclusion. And so we looked at some of the patterns, modus polens, that is affirming the antecedent, modus polen, uh, tolens, that one is or uh, denying the consequent. And then we looked at uh, some of the examples that when you um, you see them, you can critically think and say <laughs> that this is a deductive argument or this is an inductive argument. And then we said that with the inductive argument, some of um, you to know how, and maybe if, if exam, an example is given and you want to uh, find out if it is an inductive argument, mostly the uh, consequent is negated. Yes, so that's what I meant. Very good. I just wanted to make a little intervention. That was a good, uh, you know, content you delivered. So those who are not here could at least also benefit, or those who have not bothered to look at it would, would benefit from that. So thank you, uh, Johnson. The the thing with syllogism is the argument has to be a deductive argument first. Okay, then it should be two premises leading to a conclusion, like you said. So it has to be a deductive argument. Not an inductive one. That's the only little addition I want to make. Well done. Janet, go ahead. There was another hand. There were three hands up. I want to know what you learned from the unit six. Then I'll just help you finish up with the hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. If there is time, we can start with the unit seven. But there is the link, the recorded lecture, uninterrupted at, at your resource too. If you look at the uh, interim assessment and exam dossier. There's a document there on it. It has links. I have said this over and over and over again, but I know that there are people who haven't heard me say it before, <laughs> even in this group. It is there. There's been several announcements prompting you that the recordings are there. Those ones are recorded lectures, uninterrupted. It's not a, a live session like this on the unit because of the seeming technicalities here and there. We don't want students to feel stranded. So they are there for unit seven. I think I prepared that. Then the unit six that we have we have done a good portion of and we are going to mop up today was also done by another colleague. The units nine and ten are there. For your interim assessment, you don't even need to do the units nine and ten yet. Everything we've done up to unit seven would be part of your interim assessment. So you should engage the recorded lecture. It is the source of all questions, of course, on that unit, guided by the textbook. So if there is a content there that is not in the textbook, then you don't need to worry your head over. We try not to, but sometimes when colleagues are explaining, they might bring in stuff that you don't directly see in the textbook. That's why you shouldn't stress yourself so much. Be guided by the textbook, but However you go around it, you must engage those recordings. A word to the wise is enough. So I'll give you just slides on that, on that unit seven to help you. Sometimes you need just pointers. You don't want to listen to the whole thing. So you will have the slides, of course, extracted from the textbook. You have a course outline to guide you. Then you would have the recorded lecture profile, which narrates and then puts content to the skeletal uh, you know, slides before we will meet and discuss it fully as if you had no content whatsoever on it. All these are because we don't want you to have an excuse to, to not to do well. Okay, so if you go to that dossier there at your resource to every group's dossier, every group's resource to has that dossier, it is there. Okay, let me take Isaac Lamte. So you have to do that because after next week's session like this, the next will be maybe I think the Thursday or so the IA start. So you have to do some work by yourself. And then when we meet, it will be more interactive, more helping you 
you know, understand what you didn't understand there. Not for me to be telling you what is already there, like I always tell the class, okay? I want you to have that posture for all the courses you are doing in the university. This is university, it's not senior high, where it is the teacher that is coming to tell you something, maybe, so that you will know it. No, here it is university. So you are given an outline guided with readings, topics, what have you, even before the, the, top, the teacher gets to that topic. The reason is so that you do your work, your reading around your, your content, and that's what we call research. Then when you come to class, the lecturer helps you. So university teaching is lecturing. Look at the name. The person comes to lecture to help you to understand. We engage together. If you do not do that, the unit seven will be difficult for you. Even the ones we've done already will be difficult for you and your police. So I'm speaking through you to the full student body that are working now. Engage the content. Okay, so I take Isaac Lamptey say. Go ahead, please. You are muted, so you may want to unmute us. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, please, last week we, we learned about the two types of arguments. And we, we learned that the two types are deductive a deductive argument and the inductive argument. And we saw that the inductive argument, if the, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is also naturally true already. Then the inductive, we, we looked at, we said that for that one, the conclusion may not necessarily follow, even if the premises are true. Then we looked at examples. We looked at examples of the inductive and the deductive. So we looked at examples like for the deductive, we looked at we looked at example like all students write exams. Amma is a student, so she writes exam. It's it's it follows. You could you could see clearly that because Amma is a student, it follows that. So that one is like the conclusion is naturally true. Then the inductive, you realize that we looked at the example like most Ghanaians are hospitable. My mother is a Ghanaian, therefore she is hospitable. That example, you, you realize that the conclusion doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily true. It, it doesn't really, it doesn't follow because though all, all Ghan, eh, most Ghanaians might, eh, might be hospitable, but it doesn't mean that because my mother is a Ghanaian, she's also hospitable. So last week, that's what we, we learned. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. That was a very good summation. And so the little addition again is that in the in the inductive argument example, the reason, like our friend Isaac said, is even if we assumed it to be true that most Ghanaians are hospitable and my mother is a Ghanaian, the most doesn't mean all. So we we accept it to be true, even if we do that we are not necessarily required from the premises given, you see. The thing is, from the premises that has been given to us, it doesn't give us enough justification, ground, a guarantee, a proof, okay? So if, uh, on our screen, I'm going to project. Thank you very much, it was good. I'll take the others, don't put your hands down, okay? We are not necessarily giving a guarantee that the conclusion must also be true if we were even to assume that the premises were true. This is the example your friend just gave. I'm projecting now. Okay. So if you said most Ghanaians are hospitable and my mother is a Ghanaian, we are not necessarily giving enough grounds to absolutely necessarily claim therefore that she is also hospitable because she could be part of the few left out. So that's the point Isaac makes to help us remember deduction versus induction. I mean, in these two summations given by your colleagues, you realize that the focus is not on whether or not the premises actually are true out there by observation. We are not saying it is necessarily true out there by observation. If we were observing, we will find out that uh, uh, all students write exams. No, some don't. Some are students, they don't write exams, you see. They do 10 papers, even those ones are not exams. They don't, some are not even examined. It's just fun. Look at the little children at school, Montessori. They go and play, uh, no exams, then vacation. It's just a time away. 
so that mommy can work. So the point is, it might not actually be true by observation that all students write exams, that statement, that premise, okay? Then Amma is a student. Amma may not, that Amma in question may be a cook. She's not studying, she may be the house help. She may be uh, uh, even the, the, the lecturer and so on. So she might not even be a student. Therefore, when we are talking deduction, and I want to chip that in quickly, we are not talking about actuality, actual observation. That is why we say, uh, uh, validity is not proof. Uh, is, I'm so sorry. Validity is not what truth. T R U T H. The fact that an argument is valid doesn't mean it is the truth. We are not talking truth, actual truth out there. It's just relationship between the premises and the conclusion. Very good. I want to take more. Let me hear from you. We have done that discussion already. I'm just going to top up with hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. That's all. Then we practice more using universal negations, universal uh, affirmative, affirmative statement, where both antecedent and consequent have not not inside. Those are the things we are going to do today. And so I need to know whether you've done your bit. I'll take Janet now. Then afterwards, I take Abdallah who will come to bless. Go ahead. I like to mute you so that I don't interrupt you when you are talking. So please go ahead, Janet. Afterwards, I'll take Abdallah and come to bless. Janet, we are listening, please. If you are not there, let's take Abdallah. Abdallah, go ahead. Abdallah, Pante. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, sir. Please, last week we also learned about the syllogism. So we were able to start with two, which is the Buddhist and After the uh, premises, you have to affirm the antecedents before affirming the consequence. And Very we also learned that in the Moody students, we do, we do fallacies. And the fallacy is fallacy of affirming the consequence. If you were to affirm the antecedents and you vaguely affirm the consequence, it's a fallacy in Moody students. And in Moody students, we also. Yeah, there's a few learn that we have to or deny the consequence after the premises. And the fallacy of the Buddhist students is also that when you were to negate the consequence and you mistakenly negate or deny the antecedent, it is a fallacy. All right, madam. And again, I was going through the slides and I realized that we have to learn about generalizations, which is the law-like generalizations and the statistical generalizations before we come to the uh, syllogism. But it seems like we've moved from that place or we've jumped from that place. Hey, my and brother, to... are you the lecturer now? <laughs> no, the way you are saying, uh, you realize that we have to before this. My brother, sometimes students don't know. Are you the one teaching? <laughs> That's the first thing. Secondly, listen. Secondly, when content are put there for you, they are for you. I, I don't expect that. That's what is on your screen now. I don't expect that the that's student that. is asking me to come and read this for them to hit. She sees that, that there are two. Look at the top there. Abdala, types of generalizations, universal and statistical. That one to the lecturer should come and say it after she has put it, even in slides for you. The thing is in your textbook. You are, it's on your course outline. She has put it on slides. We have had a discussion on the unit. You want the lecturer to come and open the slide like this and tell you there are two types of generalization for you to hear before the student to know that there are two types of generalizations. You see what I said before we started? That's the problem. This is university. Okay. So I'm no, no, it's not you directly, okay. but I want to address that to the class. Otherwise, you will struggle in the university. That's not how you are earning. Yeah. We, are, we give our students, let me finish, sir. We give our students an honorary degree. Do you know why it is called that? Because we honor you. We don't just say, oh, the following people have graduated. No, it's an honorary degree. You do some work. So <laughs> look at it on the screen. This thing is there. I, I, apart from even the fact that you are not determining which one should come before which. This is unit seven. I put it there because 
it will help you. I could have just talked about universals like we did last week. We did universals. You said universal statements are conditional. That's what we said. So when we say it is a universal okay. statement, uh -huh, we have dealt with that. We even learned how to open them out, antecedent and consequent. The thinking of students, generally speaking, I'm, I'm, being, I'm committing hasty generalization fallacy. I'm including everyone. But generally speaking, the posturing must be right. Otherwise, you will not do well in the university. And the reason is, when things are put down for you, it is for you, the student, to do the engagement of that content. What you don't understand is what the lecture comes to help you see. The lecture doesn't come to tell you that there are two types of generalizations. Look at what is there. That's why it is a requirement that you pass English, core English, basic English, core maths, some social studies, before you come into the university. Otherwise, you won't be able to engage the content. Because this is written in raw, very simple English for the class to see. OK? But if you said, oh, doc, when I looked at the distinction between um, statistical and universal generalization, I, I don't see why, you know, like the this one is statistical and this one. I thought that it should be this or that. That is where the lecture comes in. Not that for, for you to be told the two types of generalization. That's all you need. Even this unit, unit this doesn't talk about statistical at all. You check your textbook. But you will need it in unit seven. So I put it there for you to see the contrast. Because in unit six, you are dealing with universal generalizations, antecedent consequent come, come in when you are dealing with a universal generalization. So it helps the student if you are a very experienced teacher. You help the student by showing them what the thing is not. Then now when you focus on what it is, it helps them see the difference. There's a distinction first. So he's learning now, focusing on what? The universal. Knowing very well that you could have a generalization that is not universal, OK? So I, I just thought that I should help the class. That was a good intervention on the other side. But the second part, it's not your business now, OK? Let's take, um, uh, yes, William. OK, so there was someone before. Janet's hand just went down. Let's take back with this now. Thank you, Abdallah. Let's take Baku Bless, then we'll go to William Boache. Go ahead. We are still working Good morning. out what we discuss. Good morning, sir, On, in Unit 6. That's what we are doing, and I'll top up for you. Please go ahead. OK, please go ahead. Uh, Madam, I think some problem with the, okay. the reference class and the attribute class. The OK, so when you have, what is the reference class of a statement? At least you saw it on the slide, right? Yes, madam, please. Yeah. What is the reference in your textbook as well? What, what, when we yes. say the reference of a statement, what, what do you, give me a statement and tell me what the reference is. Uh, madam, it's like, uh, Alma and library. I didn't hear the second part. I think we are having some breaks. Go ahead. Uh, Alma is what? Ama and Kofi are oh, and the reference class. But you go ahead. Don't worry. That, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The that, reference class is that, that, it's Ama and Kofi. Everybody, look on the screen, please. Apologies, my special student. I'll I'll try and read some of the things out. But I'm just pointing out what is on the screen for your colleagues to okay. see. Okay, so on the okay. screen now, we see understanding particular versus general statements. Sir, read on, read on. Okay, okay, and the reference class is Amma no, and read, read. Please, thank you very much. Can you read what is on my screen now? Okay, okay, understanding, understanding particular versus general statements. Excellent, go ahead. Every, every statement into bracket propositions has two parts. The Very reference good. class and the attribute. Very good. Example. Example. That man is a bully. Good. That man is the reference class. Since that man is specific, countable, and finite, we describe this statement as a particular statement. So in the given example up there, that man is a bully. What is the reference Madam, class? Yes. Is that man. OK. Do, do you? Do you know why it is a reference class, sir? Or oh, that but, one you understand? But, but that, 
Okay, madam. Yeah. That was your question, eh? Uh -huh. The example I'm talking about is the third is in the test that mm -hmm. this stone is a red diamond. Yes. This stone. Yes. So this stone. This stone. Red diamond. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when I say, hold on, hold on, relax. Let, let me help you. Okay, then you get your question. This stone is a real diamond. So when I say this stone is a real diamond, what am I referring to? That's the reference. What am I referring to? Is this stone? This stone. Very good. You've yeah. done some work. That's fine. So if I say this stone, do you realize that I can I can okay? Is that a, a finite reference class or it is an infinite reference class? Is it a countable reference class? Yes, because yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very good. So because it is countable like you read in the test, because I can finish counting what I'm referring to as reference. These are all unit six, but because you've done some work, I want uh, unit seven, but I want to help you with it. This stone, okay. um, this stone is finite. The thing I'm referring okay. to, look at the language, I'm referring to some, that's the reference. Okay, so I can finish counting it. That is why okay. it is finite. And so we say specific, it's a particular statement. I'm referring to a particular thing. I can lift it. I can count it. I can finish counting, finite. But when it is not something you can finish counting, then we say it's infinite, infinity. Mm? It doesn't end. You won't ever finish counting the members of that set. For example, if I said men are bullies, I'm referring to what? Uh, infinite. Uh, Oh no, that's very good. I was just even asking, what am I referring to? So what is the reference, reference class? The reference is men. Men, okay. So if you are seated there and you had men, you see that the person speaking is referring to a class that will never end. Men that are born already, those are that are being born now, those that shall be born. <laughs> Young boys that will grow up. I mean, you and I, if we were to give birth, to, maybe I have my own one now, but maybe if you don't have a child, then the child you give birth to years to come, you know, who will be a baby boy and will grow up to become a man in some years are all included in this statement. Those that are dead and gone since Adam, those that shall die and go in the future, who are men are included. You are speaking about them. It will never end potentially. That's why we call them that kind of statement. What? A generalization. <laughs> if the reference class is described as infinite, which infinite, which makes the statement what a generalization. You are generalizing. It oh, will okay. never finish. Uh -huh. So when we go to unit seven, it will be more useful. The unit six only introduces that to show you general statement or if you like universal statement to help you open it out to see antecedent and consequent which we did last week when i say men are bullies we said it is another way of saying if x is a man then x is a bully why because every universal generalization is actually a conditional statement in disguise it's a conditional one if then statement in disguise okay so to help you because you've done some good work it doesn't hurt so much too put in content, you are able to relate to it. If someone is listening, hasn't done too much reading around that, which you should, then you don't stress yourself much. Just engage the slides, look at the slides there, in tandem with your textbook. But my friend has, so I'm telling him that if you say that man is a bully, which we see on the screen, what you are referring to, in English, you would want to say subject, but in logic, it is more, it's, it's, more, it's better to capture it as what they reference. Because sometimes the subject will be so short, but the reference is bigger. If I say all the students in this class studying critical thinking will get A's in this course. All the students in this class who are studying critical thinking will get A's in this course, full stop. If I ask you what the reference class is, the reference class is all the students in this class who are studying critical thinking. It is very long. Who am I referring to? I'm referring to all the students in this class who are studying critical thinking. You have to put all, because all the students in this class may include some who don't do critical thinking. The person speaking said, 
all the students in this class who are doing critical thinking. Yes. But if we did just merely the English subject, we may just say all the students and it would have sufficed. So the logician says, use the language word, reference class and attribute class. Attribute is what? What you are attributing, what you are saying about the reference, what you are saying about the reference. English will say predicate. So in English, you have the subject and the predicate. If I say Kofi is a boy, uh -huh. if I say Kofi is a boy, Kofi will be the subject, it's a boy will be the predicate. The logician will say, if I say Kofi is a boy, Kofi is the reference. And we talk about them in classes, in, in sets, like the way we do in math. We don't say just reference. We say the reference class, the class of what? Reference. And then the attribute class is what? The predicate. That's what, and it's, it's on your screen. So where you have a reference class or subject that is infinite in nature, if you think the infinity thing doesn't come out clearly for you, just say uncountable. You never finish counting, potentially, because of how the person is speaking. If you say women are cheat, politicians are this, all planets move around the sun. Such language is generalizations. Potentially, you are speaking for planets of all times, all places, women of all times, all places, dead already, yet to be born, you know, babies who grow to become girls, become teenagers. You are speaking about all of that. How do we check the attributes? So in unit seven, you will see the challenge we have and how it leads to pseudo scientific statements and how inductive arguments are not easy to you know, ascertain. You don't establish them with certainty. It's always a matter of probability. You know, the methodology, nomological, deductive model and all that. You see them in unit seven. That's where we'll apply this really. Okay, all right. So thank you very much, uh, my big brother. You did, you did well there, bless. Let's take William watching now. Unless someone has something else. Right? Please, those who have spoken, you want to put your hands down. You're helping your colleagues. Please go ahead, William, sir. Okay. Um, please, I want to add on to what we did last week. Um, please, please. I think last week also, we talked about we talked about um, an argument, um, sorry, a deductive argument being valid or being sound. And then we said that to draw a distinction between it being valid or it being sound. For it to be valid, then it means that there is a kind of relationship that we can draw from the premise and then the conclusion, and that the conclusion follows rightly from the premise. That means that based on the premises that have been given, the conclusion is right. That may, that will mean that whether um, that will have two sides. It can be that the premise is true or it might not be true. But as long as the conclusion follows directly after it, then we say it's valid. But when we say that a deductive argument is sound, then it means, therefore, that aside the fact that it's valid, the, the premises has to be true. When they are true, then we say that, yes, then it's, it's sound. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. I like how you said it, apart from it being valid. So validity is first of all required and then the premises being true. I, I keep projecting when your friends touch on that, then I go to that slide to help those who are now perhaps mopping up in their minds. Well done, sir. William, thank you. I want more hands. Tell me what we did. We, we covered almost everything. So, so we still need one or two more, then we can, I will quickly just add one or Johnson, not your hand shut up again. We are more than 200 already, and only four people have spoken. I wish that there will be more hands. Johnson, go ahead. Yes, please. Um, concerning the sound, the soundness, um, please, I wanted to ask if uh, on sound, on sound, did that, uh, on sound argument, I also did that. Too. What do you think? What, what then will make an argument on sound? There will be so many conditions that will lead to an argument not being sound. In other words, uh, for us to call an argument on sound, there will be so much that we could we could have seen. Mm -hmm. There could be so much. Uh, how do I even capture it? There are several reasons why uh -huh, we we'll call an argument on sound. What would be one of the reasons? Let's ask the class so that it can help us uh, get Johnson's concern. Okay. When then will we say an argument is on sound? There are only three hands up here. I'm getting worked up, old friends. Put up your hand and talk. That's how you learn. 
I don't want it to be the same hands. Thank you very much. Friend Paul Kezia. Oh, Kezia. Your hand went up. Please tell me when we will call an argument on some. I don't want to dog, please. Dog, please. When it has a premises, like the example, this table is a human. We know table is not a human, so it's it's on sound to us. So at least one thank a, a premise, thank you. When the premises are false, even if one premise is false, it's enough for you to say that then that argument is not sound. Thank you. When else can an argument be described as unsound? Don't say mute up, mute up, please. Your background is not too nice. So mute, mute up until we are ready to take you. Thank you. I'm asking again, what else? Sister says, when the premises are not true, it will give us good reason to say that the argument is not sound. And I'm asking that, I said, that's fine. We can have another reason why we'll call an argument as not sound. Which one is it? I'll end the session. Oh, we have not been told eh? <laughs> I'll end the class right now. And then when we meet next week, we'll do unit seven. Razak, go ahead. Azar Kapia, please go ahead. When it is not when it is not valid. Very good. So even where Hello. our premises are all true, we can still have a query. We can still raise an objection about the soundness of a supposed argument who has all the premises being true. Our problem would be that, oh, well, all your premises are true, but you are not qualified to be called a sound argument because, Razak says, because that argument isn't even valid at all. Excellent, that's it. So there are two reasons why we will call a certain argument as what well, unsound. I hope that that helps our friend who has the question. All right, so we are good to go now. Now, let us all work now. Write down something. We are going to start and practice uh, our modus ponens, our modus students, or what have you. So develop a mode. We are continuing with our discussion from last week. I think you've done a good job with the recap. Write down, if you do not study, then you will not pass. If you do not study, then you will not pass. If you do not study, then you will not pass. That's the premise I'm giving you, the first premise. That's the mother premise, okay? Then you will. I'm giving you a conclusion so that you tell me what the hidden premise is. What I have just given you, where I give you the main premise and I give you a conclusion, and then I tell you to find the hidden premise in my argument. It's called an end termin. And I, I don't want to be, be the one even telling you that because it doesn't help you. An end termin, it is spelled N die name, but it is pronounced end termin. E N T H E. M E A I J S T H E T H Y M E M E N T I M E M but pronounce what N T M E M. What is that? When you have an argument, of, oftentimes it has to be the valid one because you are going to be able to deduce the conclusion, even when I didn't give you give you what the second premise. I gave you just the main premise. That's the the generalization. Okay or the, the main premise, then I gave you the conclusion and then I'm asking you to perform magic, find the hidden premise that led me to this conclusion. So let's start our practice of modus ponens from there. 
If you do not study, then you will not pass. Suppose I concluded, therefore you studied. Therefore you studied, write it down. So we started, if you do not study, then you will not pass. My conclusion is therefore you studied. Now this is the question. Tell me what the hidden premise was that took you to the conclusion, therefore you studied. Then you will tell me which pattern of validity led you to that place. I'm giving you two minutes. Everyone should work. There is close, we had close to 300, 290 something now. I see only one hand up and I is back on it. I know what I've done in your questions. <laughs> I know what my colleagues have sent me as questions that we should put in the pile. So you should better have a different posture as a class. 295 people, hands raised at three, it's not good. I don't want to believe that you don't know, you know, but you feel that participation doesn't matter. It does. So everyone work at it. The starting point, if you do not study, then you will not pass. Conclusion, therefore, Kofi studied, he studied, okay? I'm asking you to give the hidden premise and then to do what? To tell us which valid pattern was used. Asamoa, uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel Asamoah, your hand was up. That's why I called you. Emmanuel Asamoah, please, your hand is up. If you are speaking, they can't hear mute because we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Go ahead, sir. Hello, madam, please, can you hear me? I can hear you now, Ted. Go ahead. Okay, so, madam, I think, I think that the hidden premise is um, you passed. You passed. Very good. What was the valid pattern you used? Ma Modus ponens, please, madam. Modus what? Paul or Zimu? I can't hear you. <laughs> Modus ponens. I said, is it Paul or Timothy? Okay, there are more hands up. Thank you. Let's take Jephthah. Left our mute and, and answer. Good. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, sir. Um, please. The hidden premises you passed. Very good. And then the pattern is modus ponens. Is it ponens is or ponens? Ponens. P O N E N S. So if I gave you. If you do not study, then you will not pass. What is your antecedent, Jephtha? The antecedent is you will not pass. Oh, antecedent. I said if you do not study, then you will not pass. That's what I said. You see, if you do not study, then you will not pass. Now I'm asking what is the antecedent? Okay, Jeff, thank if you. Let me take let me take Audrey. Don't 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 lose track. Okay, so let's listen to Audrey. Then we'll all come back to where we were. Audrey Boachua. Yes. It's you will you will pass. And it's modus to lanes. Very good. That's the correct answer. Explain your answer. I'll shut up. I want to mute and, and shut up so that you can talk. Explain to your colleagues why, how you arrived at that. Because in modus students, like the consequence comes first. Sometimes the consequence comes first before the antecedents. And 
your questioner have to be positive. If oh, or like you have to negate it. If it's um, not, you have to turn it to like positive side and the antecedent will negate, like it will be negating. Very good. The important thing you said, which your colleagues missed, because they got the negation bit, but they forgot to bring the consequence first. You see, they forgot to bring the consequence first. You see, when, when I said, if you do not study, then you will not pass. I'm saying, if you do not study, then you will not pass. Antecedent is, you do not study. Consequence, you will not pass. How do you know antecedent, the if clause? So look on my screen now. I'm taking you back to how to identify the if clause and the then clause to know your antecedent and consequent, which is what you should be focused on as a class, not on other things that weren't put there, or you did it's there, but you didn't hear me say, because even the one I said, you haven't revised it. So we teach strategically for understanding. Look on your screen now. We can clearly determine, I want one of you to read, please. Anybody read that? Yata, help me read, okay? You or the other gentleman. So Yata, read for me if you are, if you are still, yeah. Okay, so universal general, or oh, I should just read the points. Oh, please read the whole thing. This guy. Universal generalizations as disguised conditionals. We can clearly determine the antecedents and the consequence of our statements when written as a conditional in brackets, if then statement. Antecedents, the if clause. Consequent, the then clause. Example, if X is a man, then X is a bully. Antecedent is X is a man. Consequent is X is a bully. Example, if X is a student, then X cheats. Antecedent <laughs> is X is a student. Consequent is X cheats. Excellent. Well done. So the whole class now, but since Jephthah is on the mic, we'll let him answer for us. So Jephthah, if I said, if you do not study, then you will not pass. If you do not study, then you will not pass. What is our antecedent, please? No, please, our antecedent is you do not study. Good. And our consequence. And what is our consequence? Uh -huh. You will not pass. Excellent. So now we know our antecedent and we know the consequence as it was given to us. These not there, we didn't introduce them. It's given. If we wanted to do modus ponens, another name for modus ponens is what? Class? I want a chorus answer. Then we all mute. What's another name affirming, for modus ponens? Affirming the antecedent. Mm. I want to do the antecedent. antecedent. Yes. Affirming the antecedent. Affirming the antecedent. Thank you very much. Now we can mute. So when we are doing modus Opponents, valid patterns, we are being admonished I mean the antecedent. to affirm the antecedent right after the generalization. So on my screen, I projected modus ponens. All mangoes are fruit, our famous example that we worked with. As soon as we have all mangoes are fruits, we will know that our antecedent is X is a mango, our consequence is X is a fruit. Then we were told right after that one, what you should do next is to affirm the antecedent, bring the antecedent as it was given to you next. Do that, that's the rule. So our example that we are working with now is if you do not study, then you will not pass. Jetta tells us that the antecedent is if you do not study. So the if is of you do not study. We are told that we want to do mod. If we wanted to do modus ponens, what we'll say next will be, you do not study. Then we can conclude, therefore, you will not pass. 
That would have been modus ponens, Paul. Modus ponens, P for Paul. Okay. But my question said, and that is where the lady, um, where is the name? That is where I think it was Audrey got it correct. And she said, was it Audrey? So that I don't give credit to the wrong person. I think it was Audrey. She said, Madam said, if you do not study, then you will not pass. I didn't tell you the hidden premise, but I concluded, therefore, you passed. Or better still, Kofi passed. I put a name there, Kofi passed. Now, what have I done to this conclusion? Almost all of you who responded got it correct. You have negated the conclusion because the original, these original statements are there. Both of them have not not there. So it is the antecedent that we find now in our conclusion that therefore you passed. This antecedent that Jephta just showed us, that's what, if you do, hey, I'm so sorry, if you do not study, then you will not pass. What we see now, our conclusion is what? What did I say? Therefore, you study there. Eh? Let me put variables in so I don't confuse you. Therefore, you study. Premises to arrive at what? Therefore, you study. It. So let's work it out together. Antecedent, you do not study. Consequent, you will not pass. If I concluded and said, if you do not study, then you will not pass. And my conclusion is, therefore, you studied. Then it tells me that I have done something to my consequence over there. And that is what has led to what? The antecedent. I have negated the consequent first, and then I concluded by what? Negating the antecedent. So what I have done now is what? The new argument reads this way. If you do not study, then you will not pass. You passed. Therefore, you studied. Those who need a lot of time to follow, I've done it again so that the confusion is clear, okay? If you do not study, then you will not pass. You passed. Therefore, you studied. This is what modus tollens. What did we do? We brought the consequence first and concluded with the antecedent. But because we are bringing the consequent first, we negated it. And we concluded by also what? Negating the antecedent. What does it mean to negate? If the original is negative, the negation becomes positive. If the original is positive, the negation becomes negative. So this reasoning pattern that we have just done is what? Modus tollens. Why? Right after the general statement, the conditional statement, we brought the consequent next, and then we concluded with the antecedent. In each case, we negated. Any questions? Then we practice with another one. Hello, Doc. So what we are working with, yes, please. Put your hand up. What we are doing yeah, now is what? I'm sorry. What we are doing now is N premises, where I give you a premise and a conclusion and tell you to introduce the hidden premise. So we do another one. If you do not have a passport, please write it down. I also write mine down so that we don't go round 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 before we come to the original. I'm working with both negations. In this instance, we'll do one side only negated, okay? So that you practice, you know all the possible ways of writing the same thing. Now, in just a minute, I'll take your question. So write this down. If you do not study, then, you will pass. 
I have changed you. Is this not the same as the earlier statement given to you? If you do not study, then you will pass. What is the antecedent, please? I want a chorus answer. You do not study. You do not study. You do not study. You do not study. So you got it. So we know our antecedent. What is the consequent? You will pass. 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 The class is alive now. Very good. Now that we we know our antecedents and know our consequences, I've seen Lee's hand, I've seen Jerry John's hand, I've seen uh, Melvin's hand. Hold on, all of you. I'll take your question shortly. So let's go through. Let's do. Uh, I won't I won't show you what pattern, but I want to give you a conclusion. So you tell me what is the hidden premises, and tell me which reasoning pattern it is that we have done. Okay. So you have antecedents and consequences. Now, what if I concluded, therefore, therefore, you studied. Put up your hand. My conclusion is, therefore, you studied. What is the hidden premise? And which reasoning pattern is it? I see only three hands up. It's not good. If you do not study, then you will pass. Therefore, you studied. Tell me the hidden premise and, and tell me also which argument pattern is it? Seven hands. No, no, no. Is it not, not, not? Let me take Zuta, delight. Okay, we, are, we have 10 hands now. That's better. Zuta, go ahead. Please unmute first. Hello, Doc. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. The premise <laughs> you, you do not pass. Very good. Which reasoning pattern is it? Which type of validity is it? Zuta, you are muted, please. Hello. Yes, I can hear you now. Zuta, which pattern of validity is it? I see that you are talking, but I can't hear you. Go ahead, Zuta. Your answer is correct, but I want to know which pattern of thought, because that could be the question. The question may be two in one. So if you introduce the hidden premise and you don't tell us the pattern, you score only one mark out of the two. So go ahead. Please, is um modus polens? Is it is it polens or tolens? Your answer. How did you arrive at your answer? Did you use tolens or ponens? Ponens. But if you use ponens, you won't arrive at this answer. So let's listen to you. I don't want you people to do uh, chat, uh, you say chat out. I want you to understand. Let's take, um, thank you, Zuta. Listen, uh, it's not, the second answer is not correct. Let me take Richmond Asari. Richmond, go ahead. Richmond, Hello. go ahead. <laughs> it's the modus to lens. Good. Why? Explain it. This is because you denied the consequence. You said you will not good. pass, but in the question you said you did not pass, so you denied it. Very good. My dear Zuta, you have to take note of that. So we started by saying if you do not study, then you will pass. Something happened in the middle there. It was left blank. Then we came to say, therefore, you studied. Now, what have we done in the conclusion there? We have brought the antecedent as a conclusion. Look at it very well. Therefore, you studied. But the original was you do not study. 
So we concluded by saying, therefore, you start, that means we have negated the antecedent in the conclusion, which gives us a sign that we did something with the consequent first, which led to this uh, conclusion. So we have to have negated the consequent. That happens when you are doing two lens. So your answer was right. You say you do not pass. That's correct. Therefore, it will lead us to the conclusion you studied. We are working with the given premise, not how we think in the world, no. But we have been given certain evidence to work with. Now, if you arrived at this conclusion, then the pattern, like your friend said, is modus tollens. And this is how we examine you. Okay, very good. We keep practicing. That's why I'm doing that with you. That's my heartbeat for this, this unit, not, not at the other matters. Okay. Let's let's do one more. Everyone write it down, please. Starting point. If you win a lottery, if you win a lottery, then we will travel. If you win a lot, then we will travel. Therefore, we will travel. Therefore, we will travel. If you win a lot, then we will travel. My conclusion is therefore, we will travel. What's the hidden premise? I still see only 10 hands. 13 now, 14. Can you repeat the question? Yes, if you win a lottery, then we will travel. Now our conclusion is, therefore, we will travel. 24, very good, that, that is better. Now, what is the hidden premise and by which pattern of reasoning, did we arrive at that? What's the hidden premise first and foremost? So I'll take um, Jerry, John, okay? Jerry, go ahead. You're muted, please. The hidden premise that you want a lot you. Very good. What is the valid pattern used, please? The valid pattern uses modus tollens. So, so work it through for me and let me see. Because it's not correct. The valid the pattern, pattern is not correct. Uses... Sorry, sorry, modus tollens, sorry. Okay, very good. One more trial with those two. I'm, I'm mixing the tolerance and the opponents together. Let's do one more. Suppose I said all plants survive. All plants survive with water. <clears throat> all plants survive with water. Conclusion. <clears throat> Conclusion. <clears throat> Nancy survives <laughs> with water. What is the hidden premise? All of us. Nancy is a plant. Nancy. Nancy is a plan. 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 Nancy is Oh, no. 
That is all I want. So you get that one. Very good. Paul. Now you made a machine. Now let's assess the following argument. Then we are ready to do hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. The rest is practice. Okay. So suppose I gave you planets orbit the sun. Planets orbit the sun. That is, they go around the sun. Eh? Then I conclude. Therefore, the Earth is not a planet. What is the hidden premise? Which type of argument, uh, which type of valid pattern is, is it? And is it sound or unsound? You see three levels of questions. What is the hidden premise? Which valid pattern is it? Is it sound or not? So let's go. Planet of it is sound. The conclusion is therefore the Earth is not a planet. And I'm asking you to tell me the hidden premise that will make this Earth, I mean, what, valid? Describe or determine the type of valid pattern and more, more so tell me whether it is sound or not and why. Who is answering that? We, we can't do a, a chorus answer for that. So check up your hand. Isaac Comensa. Let me take Isaac Comensa. Oh, Casey, your place is noisy. Let's take Isaac Comensa. Isaac, please unmute first. Yes, madam. Right. Um, the hidden premise is the earth is the, the earth does not orbit the sun. Very good. Which valid pattern have, have we used so far? I need to orbit the sun. Should I, should I go over? You were not writing. Planet orbits the sun. Therefore, the Earth is not a planet. That is modus stolen. It's very good. Is this sound or not? Please, it is sound. What makes an argument sound? Okay, I get to. Is this sound or not? You see how I've taken my time today. It's not. It is not sound. Why? Because the X is also a I didn't hear you, please, my dear. Go ahead again. It is not sound, yes, but why? Madam, please. Uh, not the Earth is also a planet, and the Earth orbits the sun. That's why the it's Earth sound. orbits the sun. The second premise that we put there is not true. That's the only reason. Okay. Uh, our new argument, which our friend uh, Echo helped us see, will be what? Planets orbit the sun. The Earth does not orbit the sun. Therefore, the Earth is not a planet. That is the new argument, which we identified as what? Valid by what? Modus tollens. Then I'm asking whether this is sound or not. Planet yes, it is valid, but it is not sound. Our problem is the second premise. It says the Earth does not orbit the sun. But in that, for soundness, we look at the actuality of it by observation. We know that the X orbits the sun. So this one is an example of a valid argument, which is not sound. Go for tutorials, my friends. Otherwise, you won't do well. <laughs> I've said that too many times this morning. All right. Now we will continue with mopping up. So please go to your slides or look on the screen better. Still. Look on the screen. Let's start from the beginning to where we are, and then we'll top up. Or perhaps we do our 
um, hypothetical syllogism rather, when we are done, then we'll come back to mop up, we'll go from slide to slide and make sure everything on the slide is covered. It is your responsibility, friends, to engage the content guided by your course outline. The course outline is telling you what you'll be examined on for that unit. So study it alongside and then you'll do fine. Valid deductive forms continue. That's what I projected now. So we know the modus ponens and tollens. We know when instead of affirming antecedent, we go and affirm consequent, we create a fallacy of affirming the consequent. We know that if instead of denying the consequent, we go and deny the antecedent, we we'll commit a fallacy called the fallacy of denying the antecedent, and so on and so forth. Your friends took us through all of those. Now, the third valid form is called hypothetical syllogism, and I expect that by now you have seen it already. I'm just going to point out stuff to you. What's the first clue to help you identify hypothetical syllogism valid pattern is to see that all the three statements, you know, it's a syllogism, so it will have two premises and a conclusion, and it is valid. All the three of them, the two premises and the conclusion together are universals. All, 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 I'm pointing on the screen now. And we know that universals are also conditional. So it could be what? If then, if then, if then. That's the first clue. When we did modus, whatever, whether modus ponens or tollens, both of them start with what? A universal, just one. The next premise becomes a particular statement. This thing, that's particular. Okay, so we started by saying when we did modus ponens, we said all oh, mangoes are fruits. This thing is not a fruit, therefore it is not a mango. That would be tollens. The point I'm trying to make to help you have a first hand, a very smart, fast way of choosing options is what? To look out for some pointers. If it is modus anything at all, whether ponens or tollens, there will be only one universal statement in the premises, there will be only one. Universals are also conditionals. So if you don't see all these ideas, you see if so, so, and so, then so, so, and so. Okay, there will be only one universal. So after we said all oh, mangoes are fruit, the next time, the next baby said, this thing is a mango. This is not a universal statement. This is a particular statement. The reference class is particular. The same with tollens. You can look at all the earlier examples we've had. They are all like that. Heavy smokers have lung tissue. Uh, Kofi is a heavy smoker. Therefore, he, ha he has lung tissue. Look on our screen now. All students write exams. Ama, after the all student, the next thing we saw was Ama. Ama is a so and so. That is a particular statement right after the generalization. That's why it is modus something. But when we do hypo, hypothetical syllogism, all the three statements are what? Universals. Premises and conclusion alike. Okay, so that's the first sign. Then what is the pattern? Look at it on the screen. It's simple, it's not difficult. These two are the easiest. You can do it in two minutes, but I want to talk a little, that's why. All mangoes are fruits as a first premise. You will see that your consequent in that first premise is what? Fruit, X is a fruit. Hmm? That statement X is a fruit, it's your consequent. If you don't know how to identify antecedent and consequent at this stage, that is not our, our, our problem, it will be yours. So you have to fill it up quickly. Even today, we have revised that. The if clause gives you antecedent, the then clause gives you the consequent. So if I have all mangoes are fruit, you know that that is another way of saying, if X is a mango, then X is a fruit. If you didn't know, engage that recording we had last week. Engage every content that is related to the topic and pass this course and pass well. I want you to make an A. No B plus, no C, no D. We don't want Dada and Father and Emmanuel. <laughs> we want Adam. Mm. That's why I'm, I'm talking that way. We want, we want you to have a good pass on your transcript. As a critical thinker, it should be part of your transcript that you think critically and creatively. That is what the world is looking for now, not your specific discipline. Everybody has that. Critical thinking is how you are thinking for yourself. So when they take you into the company, how you are going to help think creatively to, you know, to, to better the lot of that company. 
if you are not going to work there, to how you can think to create, if you're a policymaker, how you can think creatively. Don't let us sit down and be hungry and be begging. So the world is looking for that. Problem solvers, people who think critically and can practically reason about matters and bring responses. And that is, you have a good grading on it. It's a good starting point for any job placement or job creation. All right. So I'm just saying that, you know, antecedent and consequent. So hypothetical syllogism, apart from all the three statements being universals, the next thing is this. The first premise, watch, all mangoes are fruits. This one that is a consequent here, the fruit, X is a fruit here, becomes the antecedent in the second premise. All mangoes are fruits. Then the next premise will say all fruits are something else. That's the trick. So you create a Z. All mangoes are fruits. All fruits are edible. You see an intersection. The, the statement that was the consequent here becomes the antecedent in the second one. Or maybe to start being the antecedent and become the consequent in the second one. There should be an intersection so that they will cross out. So fruit consequent, fruit antecedent. That is what hypothetical syllogism is. Then you can conclude, therefore, that all mangoes are what? edible. Why? Because you started by saying all mangoes are fruits and all fruits are edible. Then it will mean that all mangoes are edible. You have to get an intersection. So that simply means that word of statement that was the antecedent earlier here must be the consequent. Then you say one thing is co consequent at the same time is antecedent. You cross it out, take it out. Then you can now say, therefore, all mangoes are edible. The Venn diagram version of it is where you say all mangoes are fruits. It means all mangoes are inside the set of fruits. Okay, so circle is inside triangle. And all fruits are themselves also inside what? The, the set of those, those things that are edible. So all circles inside triangle and the triangle itself inside the square. Then the circle would already be inside the square. That's the logic, okay, for hypothetical syllogism. You shouldn't go and say, so where is it? That, let's compare. On your screen now, watch please. You shouldn't go and say that all mangoes are fruits. Then you leave the fruits there and go and take another pre premise. All bananas are also fruits. So you want to conclude, therefore, that all mangoes are bananas. No, sir. That is not valid. All mangoes are fruits. The correct one is to, to our left side here. Watch. All mangoes are fruits. The next one should say all fruits are something else, are edible. Then you can conclude that all mangoes are edible. That is the correct part. The wrong one, all mangoes are fruits, then you leave fruits there and come and start with something else. All bananas are also fruits. So we should say therefore that all mangoes are bananas. That is not valid. This parallel is not a Z. So think about it. If I say all pastors go to the club and all bouncers also go to the club, therefore all pastors are bouncers. In fact, not even the meaning of it. The fact that they converge at one place doesn't mean they are the same. One may be going to do a evangelism. Another one may be going to job, to work there. There is no intercession created. But if I had said, see, if I had said all pastors go to the club and all who go to the club are bounced, then we can conclude validly from the given premise then that what all pastors go to the club. Okay, I say it again. If I said all pastors go to the club and all who go to the club are bounces, then it will mean that all pastors are bounces from the given premises. It will, it will be valid, just that it won't be sound. So if you got that, then you understand hypothetical syllogism. It's all, all, all. So suppose I said all women are cheats and all cheats will be cheated. <laughs> and the conclusion will be what? Chorus answer. Women will be cheated. Women will be cheated. Women will be cheated. Very good. By which pattern did you arrive at this? Okay. Hypothetical syllogism. Okay, very good.
Now, what about if I said heavy smokers have lung issues? <laughs> and all who have lung issues. <laughs> if I said heavy smokers have lung issues and all who have lung issues, I'm sorry, do not survive. Then what will I be saying? As conclusion. Heavy smokers. heavy smokers do not su survive. <laughs> that's hypothetical. Heavy smokers do not survive. Well, yes, that's correct. So if you got that, that will quickly do. Now, I, I gave you a clue from start. I said hypothetical syllogism has all, all, all universal. So women are this, men are that, politicians do this, lecturers are this, prophets are this, Ghanaians are this, you know, that kind of universal claims throughout for both the two premises and the conclusion. Don't confuse hypothetical syllogism with modus ponens. Modus ponens starts with the universal, but the other statements are particular, the particular statements. Okay, so we go to the last valid pattern. Well, I wanted to tell you something about the first one, where you say the two converge at the same place. I'm talking about hypothetical syllogism now, where you say, oh, look at our example, like all mangoes are fruits, all bananas are also fruit. Therefore, I want to conclude that all mangoes are bananas. That one is called the false hypothetical syllogism. It's already there. Okay. That is the fallacy that tries to do hypothetical syllogism, but does it wrong, just like the other two we saw. Then for disjunctive syllogism, it deals with what? The, the main connective called a disjunction. Don't worry your head over that. That is not really the focus. That's for the philosophy student doing element of formal logic. They will do those you know, technicalities. But you just need to know that just like in maths, we have subtraction, addition, multiplication, etc. In logic, do we have operational science called disjunction, conditional, biconditional, negation, and conjunction? Okay, we have them there. Now, disjunctive syllogism deals with the Connective called disjunction. Don't worry your head over that. It's a word that describes disjunction is or. Just like in math, when I say the sum of three and one, I use the word sum, S U M. Then it tells you add it. It tells you you are dealing with what the operation called addition. Okay. In what I say, what is the difference between five and three in mathematics? I'm talking about what? Subtraction. The word difference tells you that you should subtract one from there. What is the product of four and three? I'm telling you to multiply, okay? So certain words describe a certain operation. Now in, in logic, when we say or, either or, it is a disjunction. So that alone should tell you that if I gave you some passages and I say, or arguments, and I say, which of the following is a correct hypothetical syllogism? You don't have to even give attention to the one that says or, because it cannot be hypo anything. The operation working there is not hypo. You see, so you don't waste too much time looking at it closely. It cannot be it, the starting point, because it has or in it. The or one has the likelihood of being disjunctive syllogism. So that's the one you, you would want to look at if you were looking for disjunctive syllogism. Then you will now check to see that as you follow the whole rule or the pattern to the latter, okay? So the signal I gave you for hypothetical syllogism is that it comes with universals throughout. That is another way of saying it comes with if then, if then, if then throughout. Remember the universals are not always affirmative. They could also be what? Negative. You get that also. Uh -huh. Look on your screen. Universal affirmative or universal negative. If I say no man is perfect, you open that out by saying, if X is a man, then X is not perfect. These are all they will see. I'm pointing them out at, uh, to you. Universal negations as conditionals, they are there. Okay, in slides, not even in the textbook, far away for this one. It is in the slide that I've given you. Slides are points. Okay, so if I said no man is perfect, if you open it out, if X is a man, then X is not perfect. Now you know your antecedent and consequent. You can cook with it. You can cook modus ponens soup, or you can cook modus tollens soup, or you are able to detect a certain invalidity going on there. 
and name it and tell me that the problem with this reasoning is that it's affirming the consequent and etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know that conditionals could also be what negative and so i'm saying when you see a hypothetical syllogism it could be if then if if you study then you will pass if you pass then you will travel therefore if you study then you will travel it is still hypothetical syllogism why if then if then if then if you study then you will pass if you pass then we will travel therefore if you study then we will travel it's still hypothetical syllogism my friends okay then sometimes you will see universal negation no man is perfect and if so and so then you know that kind of thing it's still a combination of what uh, universal negations and universal affirmations they are still universal through to the end so you have to open your eyes to be able to distinguish a hypothetical syllogism from a disjunctive, uh, from a modus ponens and the others. But disjunctive syllogism is the easiest, if you ask me, because it has a totally different compound cry. It doesn't work with a conditional. It's not a compound called conditional. They are working strictly with what? A disjunction. That is name. It's a disjunctive syllogism. Either this or that. So that's the pattern. I save at Barclays or I save at Stanchat. How do you do the correct one? Negate one of the alternatives in the premises, or to, in the premises, not in the conclusion. So either I save at Barclays or I save at Stanchat. Then the next premise will say, but I do not save at Barclays. Then it will have to be automatically the other one. Okay, so I save at Barclays or I save at Stanchat. I do not save at Barclays. Then it means that I save at Stanchat or I do not save at stand chance, then you can conclude that then I save at what that is. A negation of one of the options will lead to what? An affirmation of the other, not vice versa. Why? Because of the meaning of disjunction. It is a, a, a two sets that have what? An intersection. One set is circle, the other is square, but they meet. So if you did your math well, you remember the intersection. The middle. Inside that intersection, there are some squares there and there are some what circles there. Why? Because they it, that is where they blend. That's why the children of a father and a mother would have some traits that are mommy and some traits that are daddy. Because the children are an, an intersection. You can't extract one from the other. Okay, the child has some aspect of her being mommy and some aspect being daddy because she's an intersection. So what? So the point is, if I have a circle that meets a square, where the circle represents backlist and the square represents standard, there is always the inclusive sense of what? A disjunction, the middle point where they meet, which has a blend, lukewarm, hmm? very hot water, very cold water. The middle of that is a lukewarmness, Lodician church. <laughs> That God says he will spew out of his mouth because they are not hot for you to use to do lifting. And they are not cold for you to drink when you are very thirsty. They are honey hot. You don't know where to place them. When they call, uh, we are before they are there jumping, boom, boom, jumping, boom, boom, jumping. When they call prefer people to their day, their tongues are higher. Where do you put them? We don't know where to place them. The, the, because of that troublesome set in the middle there called the inclusive sense of what this junction, you cannot say, because of that, you cannot say, I save at Barclays or Stanchat. Barclays, therefore, not Stanchat. That will not be valid. I say it again. A or B. Then you say A has happened. Therefore, it cannot be B. That is not valid at to Because if I call the A's, remember the intersection picture I'm giving you. When I pull the circles, everything that is circle along. Because of the middle intersection, I'll pull some squares with me. That's what happened. So Israel people are leaving Egypt. They came with what? Some Egyptians. The remnant. <laughs> they came with people who corrupted them on the way because they came with people that don't belong to where they are going. So think of the circle that way, the intersection that I've given you all the examples I can give. The point is, if you affirm one, this is disjunctive syllogism. If you affirm one, it will not lead to the other necessarily. 
because of the possibility of what inclusivity. So for example, I could have two accounts. It's possible to have two accounts. So if I say I save at Barclays or Stanchard, I have an account at Barclays. Therefore, you conclude that then I cannot have an account at Stanchard. That won't work. That's the point. But if I say I save at Barclays or Stanchard, we are going to check Barclays. I do not have an account there. I don't save there. Then, then we have good reason, given the premises we are working with, to accept that then she has an account at Stanchard. So a negation of one is what will lead to the other one. Nothing more, nothing less. Any questions? We are done with our valid parties. Let me take questions if you have them. And I'll now go from slide one to the end. So I saw Melvin's hand earlier. If the question he had is not clear, Melvin then ask, please. Tabita's hand is also up. I see Winifred's hand as well. Tabita, if it's a question, ask. Go up. Quickly, Tabita, please ask your question. You are all muted. So if it's a question, kindly unmute and ask. Winifred, Ansuma. Winifred, ask your question. Francisca, Fabiga. Then Melvin, you had a question. I'm calling out the name. So the one there should ask quickly. <laughs> Madam, please, what is the fallacy of doing disjunctive syllogism? The, it, the textbook didn't give you that. That's why I, don't, I didn't add it. Otherwise, you should be doing philosophy. And I'm glad to teach you. The valid patterns, there are more than 20 something. I've given you for your study. <laughs> so if you see it in some slides somewhere else, yes. if, if you see it in some slides, there is just stress, stress we are giving you. Okay? When I say that, I mean, it might help you understand it, but you will not be examined on it. It will not be fair to you. We are giving only four, okay? But there is a false disjunctive syllogism. It has a name. I don't want to bother you with that. You check your test, but you don't see it there. So don't worry your head about it. If you want to do it proper, come to philosophy. You see constructive dilemma. You see, you know, all of them. They are there. Plenty. Okay, Agi. Agi, ask your question. Oh, Melvin, is your question still there? Me, your hand was up. Was it to answer a question? Then ask. I want to take all questions now. Okay, so we'll walk through quickly from the start to the end. Let's make sure we have covered all that I put on my slides for you to guide your reading. If you learn only slides and you come and sit at the exam hall, you you get slides. <laughs> Great. As I've said it several times. Engage the recordings engage the test book, be guided by the slides, and then hear the very interactive, interesting lecture time we have that are recorded for you. That's how you learn. Engage all, because the groups are several. We don't want undue advantage given to anyone. And your lecturer here will have an upper hand of a kind because she's examining, because of her role as a coordinator. Of course, with the team. So it's fair that we give a certain frame that works for everybody. That is why I've stressed over and over and over again. If you do only the lecture being delivered by your specific lecture, whether for this group or another group, it will not be fair to use that to great students because what I am teaching you as beautiful and lovely as it is, may not necessarily be what another group is teaching. And what that other group is teaching, when I say not necessarily the same, the content proper is the same. The delivery may not be the same. So after you've had the discussion in your group, whether this one or another, you've seen the content. For you to have a fixed reference point where if questions are coming from, we will not have any challenge of what supposed unfairness, or suppose on due advantage given by some or others, get contact with the test book to guide your read. You see that almost everything we are doing here or in other groups are guided by the test. Anything outside of the test book that is in a recording is good if it helps you understand it, but it's not examinable because the other group may not have had it. So let that guide you consistently so that you do well and pass and get straight A. Then when I see you in town, you will meet Dr. Miles. Hey, Doc, Dr. Nancy, some say that. So I'll say hello. Then the way they are smiling, you know that they got an A. That's all I want. 
All right, so slide number, we are finishing our unit six very well today. Then we can end. This is what we said we will, we will want to do. Look at it. That's what your friend wanted clarity, clarity on, particular in general statements. Reference class is what helps you know whether a statement is general or particular. You look at the reference class, which is what is subject. So if you look at it and it is countable, then you can say that it is what? A particular statement has a finite or countable reference class. You look at it and it is not, then you say it was, it is what? A generalization. And there can be two types of those generalizations, which are in your slides there. We have touched on it. Okay. And then, then we know that generalizations are also what disguised conditionals. Now, look on the screen again. We, we, we are to look at four valid syllogistic patterns. We've done that. We understand what syllogisms are. We understand the logic of negation, the thinking behind negation, whether universal negations or ordinary negations. The original, if negated, becomes, uh, if the original is negative, if you negate it, it becomes positive. And if the original is positive and you negate it, it becomes negative, obviously. Okay. Then we know the four types of valid patterns. Now you know them very well. I think what is left is more practice questions. I give you, say, a premise, an end time, and then you, you generate a valid conclusion. Or I give you just the premises, and you, you give the conclusion and the pattern. Or I give one premise, one conclusion, then you give the all those dynamics there. Sometimes you use antecedent and consequent both being negated. Sometimes you use only the antecedent being negated. Sometimes you use only the consequent being negated. So they test yourself. So if it's if you are a team of people learning, you can adapt that strategy. Then where you are not obeying those rules of form, we say you are committing formal fallacies such as the ones over there. Your friend wisely asks, where is the fallacy for didact, uh, disjunctive syllogism? And I said, the, the, it's called the false disjunctive syllogism. There's one for that where you affirm one of the options and therefore you want to conclude the negation of the other. But the textbook didn't give you that. When you come to do logic proper and philosophy, we may want to engage that together, okay? So that is it. Then valid arguments being distinct from sound arguments. So these are the slides from the, the downloads. You know how to identify arguments and distinguish the parts, single premise, uh, conclusion, all the time, you know, look at it, see why the premises of an of a deductive argument proves the conclusion, see, but the premises of an inductive argument doesn't prove it, it only confirms it. So one is a proof, the other is a probability. These are all the, why deduction is topic neutral, we did that last week. And the, the valid forms again, I've been giving a note on what syllogisms are again, see, out there, particular versus general, you should walk yourself through them. Um, the two types of generalizations, you can think of them. Look at what is happening here. I said some men, so the class is infinite, yes, but I leave some members out, that is very well. Some are exempted, but the class is still infinite, therefore a generalization, but we type, statistical generalization. Few Ghanaians like final. Most women, the two out of 10 bananas have done so. Well. When I speak that, I'm speaking general. It's still a generalization, but I have exempted some members from that general class. That is what makes one a statistical generalization. And the other one was a universal you know, universe, law like. It doesn't leave anybody out. That's it. Okay, so we gave you some examples. You see, the disease is contagious, the disease specific particular countable. So we verify that. You see the word verifiability, confirmability in unit seven. If you are reading ahead, it, it will come out for you. Few Ghanaians, this one, the set is general, but it has been qualified. I've left some members out. So this is a statistical generalization. The liquid in that ball is poisonous. The liquid, particular. Green tables are scarce these days. Green tables of all times, all places. It's a generalization, a universal generalization. Okay. 
These are all from your textbook with answers there. Detailed it. All these things are there. The answers are there in the book. I picked it directly from there and put it here. And I, I tell you where I picked it from. Go to your page 191 and look at it. <laughs> How else should you be helped? Okay. Kofi is a new SRC president, reference class Kofi. So particular. Therefore, you verify it. This, this terminology, see, I faded it here because you need it in unit seven. But here you can think of it as a particular statement. All voters, look at six and seven closely. All voters prefer a count of ballots. All voters is not the same as all the voters. All voters is not the same as saying all the voters in this class have done so and so and so. One has a countable reference class. Number seven is countable. So you can verify it. It's a particular statement. The voters interviewed in this class. Okay. The other one says all voters. One or two are being for Shiki, every one of them. Okay. Then H is a universal negation. Universal negations like this one. No student registers unless forced. We have seen universal negations. Now look at eight and nine too. None of the students in that class registered for the course. Specific the students. Eighty percent of all retail stones. The reference class all retail stones. General like we type. A statistical one. I didn't want to do all this with you. Then the examples of affirmative and negative universals as disguised conditionals. I've seen it over and over again. See, where we open it out to show you antecedent and consequent. We, yeah, universal negations. See, syllogisms. We even told you how to interpret negations. Then the valid patterns themselves. We added hypo and disjunctive today. Then the fallacies, why they are fallacious. We have worked ourselves through them over and over again. Today I showed you, I say all x's are y's, all z's are also y's, therefore we should conclude that all x's are z's. You see why that is a formal fallacy called false hypothetical syllogism. That's the comparison page. Your friend already made a note of this. Valid plus true premises is what you will call sound argument. And then finito. Any question? Any questions, please? All right, so we are done for the day. I would want you to go to the resource tool, like I've said over and over again, please, and engage the recording on um, the unit seven. We'll still meet, God willing, coming Tuesday, like we do all the time, and engage a discussion on them. I plan to upload slides on that. If it comes, that will be good. If it doesn't come, you don't have excuses. Okay, prepare. Then the IA date, as soon as we receive confirmation from UGCS, in terms of the timetabling for the day, because of your numbers, you'll be given ID ranges with, with what? Uh, labs associated with it. So you will go to your specific lab that you are given. If you go to another place, you will not write there, you miss the map. It won't come to lecture, it's not a lecture issue. The university doesn't allow lecturers of a course to go and examine their own course, uh, uh, and supervise or immediately their own exam. And there's a reason for that. You have to allow those who are, have been mandated to invigilate, chief invigilator, uh, then the villagers to do their work and bring you your script when they are done. That is why the student has an obligation, you see, to get to the center as prescribed. So if your paper starts seven, suppose your time is seven to eight, it's an hour, one hour pay, and you decide to get there 7.15, don't expect that you'll be given one hour from 7.15. Then you come and talk, please. When we went, we after 20 minutes, then they said we, uh, we should go out. They didn't give us a full one. If you go to Sakai, you see that it's 20 minutes. Your time given to you to start work is 7. That means by 6.30, you are there. Just like the, the exam that we write with answer book. Do you see that? 6.30, you should be there because some people will move out and others will come in. You will settle. Then they will give you passwords for your work. Then they say start work. Start work is 7. So suppose they give you seven to eight, you don't get there seven ten after putting on your fine points, my dear sisters. Then you are expecting to do one. If you are lucky, then they will accommodate you to even do the work at all. Okay, I just want to say that on record for the benefit of those who 
may not have been able to join online with playback. So they can also hear. You go there early because that eight to nine will be the, the time given to another group. And you should understand students to step out for others to come in. That takes time. So all of those are incorporated into what the scheduling. So when we receive it from the fine gentlemen and ladies at UGCS who are helping us do that on site using university computers, you know, interim assessment. If you sit at home and you are expecting to open something, you won't get it done and you will not get another opportunity. Not because the lecturer or the coordinator or the examiner says so, it's because it's a University of Ghana exam. If you went to the center and picked an answer booklet and answered questions and they said stop work and the chief counts everything, bundles it up and brings it to the lecturer. You don't come into the lecturer's office after that and say, doc, please, uh, the I, I miss it, so I've come. I'm also coming to do my own. That's not how University of Ghana runs its exams. Take every university exam with the seriousness that it comes with, okay? So I'll put that on record. Now I can mute, I can uh, end our recording and take any one or two questions that are still pending. So keep your hand up if you have any such.